Live from KSAT 12, Good Morning San Antonio starts right now. Hi there, good morning. It is Wednesday, March 6th. Thanks for joining us and we want to let you know that we are expecting a special report from ABC News very shortly and we'll keep you posted about that. Yeah, we'll go to it immediately once it happens. But first up, we're going to check in with meteorologist Justin Horn as we go outside with live cam. And right before I walked into the studio, uh, RJ asked me, hey, what's up with this fog? What's going on? Uh, well, it is starting to roll in the San Antonio. We're seeing a little bit here. Visibility is starting to come down. Uh, so that could affect uh, your commute if you're doing a late morning commute here with the uh, visibility is now dropping in San Antonio. Let me show you the map. Uh, it's down close to zero at Stinson, about half a mile at Port SA and three quarters of a mile at Randolph. So this is a bit of a change. Just fog's kind of rolling in from the south and east. Has not affected the International Airport yet, but it probably will here within the next 30 minutes or so. I don't expect that this will last very long, uh, but it is there here probably for the next uh, hour or so. Uh, as we look at our forecast, noontime 77. Uh, we'll get up to about 84 today, mostly cloudy probably by the afternoon. So not as hot as yesterday, 91 yesterday, by the way, hottest temperature since October. Uh, and then mostly cloudy tonight, and we'll start off with more fog and probably some drizzle too as we get into tomorrow. So there's a look at the pollen count. Oak still tops the list at uh, 180 and moderate. Hackberry joins Oak in the moderate category today, and then Mold and Mulberry also there. And uh, let's look at the rain chances, actual rain chances, not just the drizzly stuff. And I think that's going to come Thursday night. We have about a 40% chance of seeing some storms. And some of those could be strong to severe. So we got to talk more about that and how it will affect your weekend, too. That's coming up here in just a few minutes. But yes, the fog, RJ, is rolling in. Absolutely, Justin. Take a look here. I-37 at the Alamo Dome. We usually see the Tower of the Americas behind me, but no Tower of Americas right there due to the low visibility in our area right now. Now, fortunately, traffic is still moving pretty good in that area. One more shot here, the fog here, 37 Loop 410. Further southeast, you do see a lot of fog in this area. Traffic is getting through in both directions there. So let's go through a lot of different things going on in the city right now. Biggest thing, Far East Side. We still are following the latest here with a car fire that has caused a major delay here. I-10 westbound over at Graytown headed to 1604. So if you're coming in from Seguin or from the Santa Clara area, just keep this in mind. There is a major backup here. It's going to be about an hour just to get through this stretch here from Zoo all the way to 1604. It has been a pretty good backup out there for a while. It's taking you out to the northwest side. We have a stalled vehicle being reported. I-10 westbound loop 1604. Not causing too many delays on I-10. Still something to keep in mind. We have a crash being reported 35 southbound at Walters. This is all, our, all of our uh, drivers coming in from the Frostbank Center area headed to the downtown area. Let's go to the downtown area now because we have a crash being reported I-35 southbound at I-10. I-10 at the wide traffic backed up to uh, North St. Mary Street. And one more here, actually a couple of things further south of downtown stalled vehicle I-35 at Division Avenue causing some delays for our northbound traffic and a stall US-90 West found at Nogalito. So a lot of different things going on, but again, we are also now seeing a lot of fog across the area. Mark and Stephanie, back to you guys. Okay, thank you very much. We're still standing by for that ABC News special report. But the big topic of discussion today, the aftermath of the biggest election day of the year until November. Well, the picture of the presidential race becoming clearer, Nikki Haley's decision to drop out of the race. Let's go to David Sears, who's standing by with a deep dive on what is a pending decision, and that's who we're expecting to hear from shortly. Yeah, just in a few minutes, we're expecting to hear from Nikki Haley. She's officially going to suspend her campaign for President of the United States after former President Donald Trump ran away with Super Tuesday, no doubt leaving Haley with no path forward. Haley will be giving a short speech, expected to be about three minutes or so. She's not expected to endorse Trump, or at least not a full endorsement. Haley was always around 20 to 30 percentage points behind Trump in the polls, and in some states she lost by even bigger margins. She even lost her home state. However, she did make history. She won Vermont last night and earlier in the week won Washington, D.C., making her the first Republican woman to win a primary or caucus. We will once again be joining ABC live for that announcement here in just a few minutes. And the reason Haley is dropping out, Trump was dominant on Super Tuesday. He won every state except Vermont. He had a big night here in Texas. The former president has 78 percent of the Republican votes, while Haley only had 17 percent. Here in Bear County, the number's about the same. Trump 74, Haley 22 percent. Trump dominated in most of the states that he won. He said during the post-Super Tuesday victory speech last night, quote, November 5th is going to go down as the single most important day in the history of our country. 
Our states are dying, and frankly, our country is dying, and we're going to make America great again, greater than ever before. Trump also saying it's time for the Republican Party to be unified. Here in Bear County, Trump pulled in 77,000 votes, while President Biden managed 64,000 here in Bear County. Those numbers for the president here and across the state and country reflect the same as they did for former President Trump. Like Trump, President Biden dominated the Democratic primary Super Tuesday states. Here in Texas, he got 85% of the Democratic vote. After his big night, he released a statement. Today, millions of voters across the country made their voices heard, showing that they are ready to fight back against Donald Trump's extreme plan to take us backwards. Biden has a chance to make his case for re-election tomorrow night. He will address the nation with his State of the Union speech. Like Trump, Biden did lose one contest last night. He lost American Samoa. 91 people casted their votes in the Democratic caucuses. Biden lost by 11 votes to Jason Palmer, a very little known candidate who is an entrepreneur. Only in America. Let's go straight to ABC News. For the outpouring of support we've received from all across our great country. But the time has now come to suspend my campaign. I said I wanted Americans to have their voices heard. I have done that. I have no regrets. And although I will no longer be a candidate, I will not stop using my voice for the things I believe in. Our national debt will eventually crush our economy. A smaller federal government is not only necessary for our freedom, it is necessary for our survival. The road to socialism is the road to ruin for America. Our Congress is dysfunctional and only getting worse. It is filled with followers not leaders. Term limits for Washington politicians are needed now more than ever. Our world is on fire because of America's retreat. Standing by our allies in Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan is a moral imperative. But it's also more than that. If we retreat further, there will be more war, not less. As important, while we stand strong for the cause of freedom, we must bind together as Americans. We must turn away from the darkness of hatred and division. I will continue to promote all those values, as is the right of every American. I sought the honor of being your president. But in our great country, being a private citizen is privilege enough in itself. And that's a privilege I very much look forward to enjoying. In all likelihood, Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee when our party convention meets in July. I congratulate him and wish him well. I wish anyone well who would be America's president. Our country is too precious to let our differences divide us. I have always been a conservative Republican and always supported the Republican nominee. But on this question, as she did on so many others, Margaret Thatcher provided some good advice when she said, quote, never just follow the crowd, always make up your own mind. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. At its best, politics is about bringing people into your cause, not turning them away. And our conservative cause badly needs more people. This is now his time for choosing. I end my campaign with the same words I began it from the book of Joshua. I direct them to all Americans, but especially to so many of the women and girls out there who put their faith in our campaign. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for God will be with you wherever you go. In this campaign, I have seen our country's greatness from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, America. God bless you. Nikki Haley, the former governor of South Carolina, former UN ambassador right there announcing that she is suspending her campaign 
and dropping out of the race. She stopped short of endorsing the former president, Donald Trump, and instead saying she congratulates him, wishes him well. She said, we must bind together as Americans, turn away from hatred and division. She also noted it is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those who did not support him. This is now... Okay, we're coming back from ABC News, and this is a perfect segue to this morning's 9 at 9, a quick recap of yesterday's election results. So with low Democratic turnout and GOP infighting, there were some surprising results across the ballot. Indeed, here's a look at some of the moments you may have missed. Let's start with the U.S. Senate primaries. Dallas area Congressman Colin Allred had a dominant victory over state Senator Roland Gutierrez. That's on the Democratic side. Here in Bear County, Allred got about 50% of the vote, outperforming Gutierrez. On the Republican side, Senator Ted Cruz secured the nomination. In the congressional race for District 21, incumbent Tony Gonzalez was unable to avoid a runoff. He fell just short of the 50% needed to secure the nomination. He'll face Brandon Arreta, who received just over 20% of the vote. In Texas House District 121, Mark LaHood beat State Representative Steve Allison. LaHood was backed by Governor Greg Abbott after Allison voted against school vouchers in the Texas legislature. The district includes Alamo Heights and parts of the North Side. Now to House District 44, where Republican State Rep John Kimple is headed to a runoff against Allen Schoolcraft. Kimple was targeted by Governor Abbott over his vote against school vouchers. Abbott backed Schoolcraft in the district, which includes Gonzales and Guadalupe counties. Former Uvalde Mayor Don McLaughlin Jr. secured the GOP nomination in Texas House District 80. He got about 58% of the vote. On the Democratic side, Cecilia Castellano and Rosie Cuellar are headed to a runoff. Another race to watch, House District 19, State Rep Ellen Troxclair appears to have nearly avoided a runoff against former State Rep Kyle Biederman in the GOP primary. Troxclair was backed by Governor Abbott and Biederman by Attorney General Ken Paxton. Dwayne Hanley won the Democratic primary and the pair will face off in November. Back here at home and the race for Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar has secured more than 70% of the Democratic primary vote. And Nathan Buchanan looks to have avoided a runoff on the Republican side. Precinct 1, Bear County Commissioner Rebecca Clay Flores was unable to avoid a runoff in a very crowded Democratic primary. It appears she'll be facing Amanda Gonzalez on May 28th. On the Republican side, Lena Prado was unopposed. The runoff election is May 28th, and in case you missed any of the races, you can find everything you need to know on our website. Just head over to kset.com and look for these stories on our homepage. And that's today's post-election 9 at 9. 914, the 12th annual San Antonio Book Festival is happening next month, and today we learn who the authors are are that will attend. Producer Haley Powers tells us how many authors are participating and what you can expect at the festival. The lineup for the 2024 Book Festival truly includes something for everyone. From nonfiction stories to issues at the border, our highways, and remembering a beloved pet, the San Antonio Book Festival highlights an array of authors from across our city, state, and the nation. So you can just come to the book festival and expect to find a conversation that is going to stimulate you and inspire you. Back for its 12th year, the San Antonio Book Festival will happen on April 13th at the San Antonio Central Public Library and the UTSA Southwest Campus. Festival goers will get the chance to hear from nearly 100 authors through presentations, panel discussions, and book signings. This free family event encourages kids to pick up a book and have some fun. We're not in the business of teaching kids to read, but we are in the business of getting them excited about reading. It's important that we build a city of readers here in San Antonio. Readers go on to be engaged citizens in the community. They vote, they visit museums, they participate in their city's culture. Out of the 95 authors coming to this year's book festival, 28 are from San Antonio, 39 are from around Texas, and the rest of the authors come from other states. You can find a full list of all the authors on our website, ksat.com. Haley Powers, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Haley. It's funny, it got foggy very quick. It did. You know, that's the nature of this kind of uh, 
rolling fog, patchy fog that we're seeing. And it's some places in town the sun's out, other places it's uh, you're just it's thick in the fog. So that's uh, that's the situation out at I-10 and 410. And you can't see anything. Uh, meanwhile, just a few miles away at the airport, the sun is out. So go figure. Uh, right now we've got uh, temperatures in the 60s, but that fog is really starting to roll in. Uh, 65 at the airport, 64 New Braunfels, 66 in Seguin, 61 Bernie, and 57 right now in Kerrville. Uh, let me show you the visibility map. And yes, the airport's still at 10 miles. You get down to Port SA, though, it's uh, about four tenths of a mile. Randolph is the three fourths of a mile, and then Stinson, a quarter of a mile. And that fog is slowly working its way north and northwest. So we'll see if it makes it to the airport. But we can see it here on the satellite picture. That's that bank of clouds and fog. It's now working through Converse and New Braunfels, uh, Von Army, and is trying to slowly lift off to the north and west. Pretty interesting cloud structure this morning. You can see that kind of line of fog and clouds. And you got kind of another distinct line here of cloud cover. This all has to do with moisture coming back into play. Yesterday was dry. And that's why it was so very warm. But now we're starting to see these dew points increase. And you got dew points in the 60s just to the south and east of San Antonio. And that moisture is trying to work its way back across the area. And so it will feel a little more humid today, especially by the afternoon. You'll get dew points in the 60s for sure. And that humidity will lead to a bit more cloud cover. So let's fast forward now to 5 o'clock today. Notice there's not much going on. We've got just a few clouds, maybe some storms up across parts of north central Texas. But this stays north of us. As we get into tomorrow morning, some showers up along I-20, but nothing here other than I think we get a little more fog and maybe some drizzle to start off your Thursday. Uh, know that that could affect the morning commute. Uh, we'll get a few showers here and there throughout the day. This is 5 o'clock, shows a couple of showers. No thunderstorms just yet. I think that holds off until tomorrow night. So let's fast forward now to 2 a.m. on Friday. Notice we're starting to get some storms going here in the hill country and then a few storms along a boundary. That's Goots East. So I think by Friday morning, those storms are starting to move in around San Antonio. This is a time frame where we could see a strong storm or two, although I don't think that it's going to be widespread severe weather. This is more just lightning and thunder, maybe a strong storm here or there, uh, and some brief heavy rain. And then this will quickly get out of here. So by Friday afternoon, we're starting to see dry air move in. Friday is going to be a warm day. Then we get a cold front through turns cooler and windy on Saturday. So if you like cooler weather, the weekend is looking fantastic. Severe weather risk. Well, the highest risk for severe weather is going to be in the hill country, that darker yellow color. But even here in San Antonio, we can't completely rule out a strong storm. Hail and gusty winds would be the main threat if we saw a severe storm here in San Antonio. Uh, and that is for, again, tomorrow night into Friday morning. Not going to get a lot of rain out of this. Maybe up to a tenth of an inch, there could be some isolated spots to get more. But this is not going to be a big rain event for South Texas. At least there is rain in the forecast, but uh, again, it's just not going to be very fruitful. 76 Thursday, 81 Friday. You see the rain chance there. The front comes through 67 and windy on Saturday. But look at the morning lows. 47 Saturday morning, 44 Sunday morning. And with the wind Saturday morning, you could see wind chills in the low 40s. Uh, and certainly Sunday morning will be chilly as we spring forward. It does rebound next week in the spring break. Looks like we'll get some warmer, warmer weather. But the weekend, uh, taking us back a little bit to February there. Mm -hmm. yeah, not too bad. I mean, it's a good start to spring break, though. Yeah, it's nice. Not great swimming weather, but well, it does warm up uh, the rest of spring break. Yeah, we have, we have time later. We have time. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Justin. 919, 66 degrees. Well, just ahead, lawmakers in Congress have introduced a bill that would ban TikTok in the U.S., how that could work in just moments. In today's Tech Bites, a TikTok showdown. House lawmakers have introduced a bill preventing distribution of the service in the U.S. unless TikTok here in the U.S. severs its ties with its parent company, Chinese-owned ByteDance. The bipartisan measure aims to keep TikTok out of app stores. Apple is now including transcripts for its podcasts. The auto-generated transcripts will appear shortly after a podcast is published. But podcasters can opt out if they want to upload their own transcript or edit the one Apple provides. The feature comes with the company's latest software update. 
Finally, Waze is rolling out new features to help get you where you're going. The Google-owned navigation app will soon let you know when speed limits are about to drop, also the best ways to get through a roundabout. It's also adding information about parking garage locations. Those are your Tech bites. Have a great day. And in your morning spotlight, we could see some big moments at this year's Oscars. Many of the categories feature opportunities for history to be made. ABC's Tim Pulliam is in Los Angeles with the milestones and records that could be shattered. Along with all the glitz and glamour on Hollywood's biggest night, some historic moments could take center stage at the 96th Academy Awards. Please send help. There's murder in Osage and the police do nothing. Lily Gladstone could become the first Native American ever to win an Oscar if she wins for her trailblazing lead role in Killers of the Flower Moon. It's, it's funny to suddenly find yourself being called auntie by all of these new young Native actors. It's, it's, a, it's a big deal. It's long overdue, but it's very welcome. <laughs> you call it trouble, I call it an opportunity. And it could be a wonderful night for Coleman Domingo, nominated for Best Actor for playing civil rights icon Bayard Rustin. If he takes home the trophy, he'd be the first Afro-Latino to win in the category. And so it's a 33-year journey, and suddenly um, I'm here in this beautiful moment, and I hope it's inspiring to my, my, my fellow performers. He can be the first great American conductor. But if the Best Actor Award goes to Bradley Cooper in Maestro, he'd be the third artist in history to direct themselves to an acting win. This is Bella. She's an experiment. Emma Stone could pull off a double feat if she wins for Best Actress and Best Picture as a producer on the film Poor Things. She'd be just the second woman to ever win in both categories for the same film. You know, nobody knows nothing until they open the envelope. That's the fun part. You're learning. Ten time nominee Martin Scorsese, the most nominated living director, could become the oldest best director winner for Killers of the Flower Moon. We're in a race against the Nazis. Oppenheimer leads the pack with 13 nominations, and while it will be tough to break the record of 11 Oscar wins for a single movie, it should still be a very good night for the blockbuster film. Eight wins would be the most awarded film since Slumdog Millionaire. Ten would put it tied as the second most awarded film of all time next to West Side Story back in 1961. Tim Pulliam, ABC News, Los Angeles. 926, 66 degrees. As we head to break, let's look out there with Trans Guide, a little foggy in some areas around the city. Here's a look at I-37 at Loop 410 where things are moving. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We continue with the aftermath of Super Tuesday. Donald Trump crushed Nikki Haley, who just dropped out of the presidential race. Well, Trump is expected to be the Republican presidential nominee set to face President Biden in a rematch in November. As ABC's Rachel Scott tells us, there were some surprises and some warning signs for both candidates. This morning, Nikki Haley is expected to end her 2024 campaign. ABC News learning the former South Carolina governor will drop out of the race today. It comes after Donald Trump swept nearly all 15 states on Super Tuesday. The former president now the presumptive Republican nominee. The stage set for a long general election rematch with President Biden. November 5th is going to go down as the single most important day in the history of our country. From Massachusetts to Virginia, Texas to California, millions of voters casting their ballots with more than a third of the GOP delegates up for grabs. Nikki Haley barely even made a dent, only winning Vermont and not even holding a campaign event. The former president didn't mention her once in his remarks. We have a great Republican Party with tremendous talent and we want to have unity and we're going to have unity and it's going to happen very quickly. Haley blasting that call for unity. In a statement, her campaign saying there remains a large block of Republican primary voters who are expressing deep concerns about Donald Trump. Exit polls showing major warning signs for the former president as he faces 91 criminal charges. With 79% of Haley voters saying they would be dissatisfied if Trump were the nominee. The exact same number saying he would be unfit for office if convicted of a crime. I don't want to vote for him again, and I don't want to vote for Joe Biden. Right now, it's kind of, I feel homeless. I feel homeless. <laughs> President Biden also won big on Super Tuesday. In a memo this morning, his campaign writing, Donald Trump limps into the general election as a wounded, dangerous, and unpopular candidate. 
But there are troubling signs for Biden, too. In Minnesota, nearly 20 percent of Democrats voting uncommitted instead of voting for Biden. A significant protest vote fueled by concerns about his age and support over Israel. Joe Biden has not done enough to um, earn my vote and not done enough to stop to stop the war, stop the massacre. Some voters now dreading the all but certain rematch between Trump and Biden, not sold on either candidate. Could he even give me one reason? Except to like, hey, that guy is bad. A Trump campaign official calling this welcome news. Despite all the attacks on his former U.N. ambassador, the Trump campaign now calling on the party to unify behind the former president as he prepares for this all but certain rematch with President Biden. Rachel Scott, ABC News, West Palm Beach, Florida. For a complete recap of the 2024 primary elections, just head to KSAT.com and look for this article. Runoff elections are coming up on May 28th. And this morning, a fire forced people living in a northeast side apartment complex to evacuate late last night. It happened just before 11 p.m. in the 1900 block of Northeast Loop 410. Firefighters tell us the blaze started on the second floor, damaging six apartments. Now, several people were evacuated, and a dog had to be rescued from a first floor apartment. One person was taken to the hospital in serious condition. The cause is still under investigation. We have new details on the search for answers in a murder case from seven years ago. Some of these details are graphic. Police and Texas Rangers searched an area in the 5600 block of Timber Steep. That's on the city's far northwest side near Tesla Road. Back in 2017, a woman who lived on Timber Steep named Sally Hines disappeared. Her head was later found in Louisiana, but her body was not. So far, all we've learned from the Texas Department of Public Safety is that Texas Rangers were at the home to process evidence. No other information on the case was made available to us. Let's take a look outside with live cam. It was foggy earlier. This shot, not too bad, but uh, some of the shots around town a little foggier, Justin. Yeah, it's pretty incredible to kind of see the different vantage points. The airport's still okay, but the fog's kind of wrapped around uh, that part of town. Let me show you to it here, uh, show you here on a map how it looks. And basically, Port S.A. down in Stinson around to Randolph, that's where the fog is right now. If you're on the north side of San Antonio, you're not seeing it. The sun is out. Uh, but Stinson uh, was down close to zero just a few minutes ago. It's, it's popped up a little more. Uh, and I suspect we'll see these visibilities improve here within the hour. But we're still seeing scenes like this on our live cam. This is I-10 and 410. And yes, the camera's up high, so it makes it a little bit worse, but uh, visibility definitely not good there. 65 at the airport, 64 New Braunfels, 66 in Seguin, uh, 64 burning, 59 right now in Kerrville. Now, it's still going to be warm today, but not near as warm as it was yesterday. Got up to 91. We're thinking 84 uh, this afternoon here in San Antonio. There will be more 80s on the map today. A bit more cloud cover and more humidity uh, to contend with, too. All right, 33 days away. Now for our total solar eclipse. Here's our fun fact for today. The last total solar eclipse to pass over San Antonio was in 1397. Can you believe it was that long ago? Incredible. So that's why we're so excited that this is passing over at least part of San Antonio this year. Incredible opportunity. Make sure you're making those plans and uh, prepare for traffic and lots of people as uh, we get closer to the eclipse. Guys. Justin, I see some stalls and disabled vehicles around town. And right now, yep, that's just about it. Uh, we are seeing that lingering fog as you look live at 37 and Houston Street. Well, our San Antonio Spurs hit the road after back-to-back -back wins to take on their I-10 rivals, the Houston Rockets. David and RJ are back with a breakdown of a tough loss for our Spurs. It was a tough loss. Very tough. <laughs> Physical game. You know, I, I like to see that. I like to see the Spurs and Rockets mix it up. You know, I thought Bill Len, Sean Elliott, early in the game, they said they like to see the old look, the Spurs, black and silver, versus the Rockets, red and white. I like that. I-10. We're going back. back to that. Akeem Olajuwon days or the Yao Ming days? Which ones are we going Both, to? Both, yeah. I Akeem so. versus David and then Yao Ming, Tracy McGrady versus Tim Duncan. Good to see that uh, out there from these two teams. A lot of times the Spurs won, though. That's true. Not like <laughs> But, okay, when we did play, David, after okay. uh, there yeah, were was questions a, about yeah. him, gonna, he had a, had a sore shoulder. He had but, a little uh, wing problem over there. That left wing was a little, oh, I like little that. Illing. So, you know. That wingspan, okay. Yeah, I get it. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. All, right. uh -huh. um, all right, David, so obviously big matchup here. Wemby taking on Elton Shingoon, <laughs> uh, the Rockets All-Star. It's just Wemby amazing. Came out, came out pretty hot out the gates. Yeah, and you know, and the thing about it, the Spurs were like back and forth. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever got a really big lead. 
Spurs would go up a little bit, then Rockets come back, Rockets go up a little bit, Spurs would come back. So, you know, it was it was back and forth. I think, all right, there's another one I can't turn away from because it looks like the Spurs are going to be right there at the end and have a chance to win it. Mm-hmm. And no. It did not happen. Did all not right, happen. so Spurs did leave at okay. did lead after the first half, 53 to 47. Right. Let's go to the second half because I think we have those highlights coming up here. Yeah. And uh, this was interesting, oh, David. Played see, you wanted some physical. There. Here we go. You got your little like physical it. right there. Got a little physicality. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And look at Jeremy Sohan. I ain't backing down from you. I don't care who you are. <laughs> Is he channeling uh, Peter who got Dennis the, Rodman with yeah. the number 10 there? In the yeah, well. Uh. He ain't no Dennis Rodman, that's for sure. Uh, um, wow. that, which is a good thing, trust me. Um, I, did he? He got the technical too, didn't he? I think there were double technicals called. Yeah. Okay. Sohan got the flagrant foul, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, like a flagrant, mm-hmm. a flagrant, flagrant one flagrant or something one. like that. Yeah. 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 So they, you know, separate a little pushing, shoving there, but. Uh, yeah, and you saw Emi Adoka and Pop right there. Of course, Emi Adoka, former Spur assistant, and you know he was yeah. uh, he was something else. When he was here, and he's really got this uh, Rockets. He got him some veterans on the Rockets. Mm-hmm. They're not they're not exactly where they want to be, but you know, at least they're they're pushing, they're shoving their way to the top. <laughs> so, they're trying to get there. Um, and, okay, you were making some comments earlier yes. about the way that Wimby was getting. Yeah, so interesting. You want to say strategy. abused? You want to say uh, used? Uh, uh, you you want to say? I would say that uh, okay. Alperin Shingun. Uh, I would Ooh. say he took Wimby to school. I, you know, this was kind of the first time that we've seen sort of a guy attack Wimby the way that he did. And even in the post game, David uh, Shingun said that you know what? He's like, the Spurs played me one on one on Victor. And he's like, and I just went at it. Yeah. Forty five points he did. later. Forty five points worth. He put up a, a. He like you said, he was kind of doing a lot of fake moves, a lot of hook shots, a lot of different sort of ways to get around Victor's height and uh, I thought that was interesting to watch yes well and the amazing thing was it wasn't he wasn't shooting a lot of threes no he was down was under the basket right he was in the paint he was doing a lot like you said a lot of fakes he was going up and unders and I mean and Wimby was standing right there and he was still able to get around him and get under him and and get a lot of baskets and it was it was an impressive impressive display and I think Wimby learned a lot I would say so, I would, yes. I would hope yeah. so. That, I would hope you know. so because also, David, the way they defended uh, Victor in this game was that uh, they actually had Dylan Brooks play Wemby as well. So every time Wemby yeah. kind of went out to the perimeter, the, the Rockets went ahead and put Dylan Brooks on him, who is a uh, one of the better defenders in the NBA. But uh, he's a six-seven guy taking on Wemby, and I thought it was an interesting strategy by Ime Odoka against the Spurs. Something else that we noticed last night that we've noticed before, especially this time of the season, Wemby looked gassed. There you go. At times, of course, yeah. the guy was wearing him out, but he also looked gas. And I just, I, you know, you wonder about these rookies who play. Like, he's given a lot of effort mm-hmm. since the All-Star break. I mean, he's come out and game in and game out, getting four, five, six blocks, playing some great defense, scoring 20, 30 Bless points you. a game. And I think he's worn out. And I think the this 82-game season for a kid who's not used to playing, you know, 20, 30 games a year, yeah, yeah. this is starting to starting to wear on him a little bit. Because now he's up to of what he what he played last night. He's up to a lot of minutes. He only played, yeah, yeah he, was, uh, he had some foul trouble. 31 yesterday. minutes last yeah, night. So it's still, it's good to foul, see him so, But he's getting he's getting to play more more playing time. So I think he's starting to feel the the effects of an 82. Yeah, you know, they season. always talk about sort of the, that rookie wall that these guys yeah. kind of hit. And for him, he was playing in. In Paris, remember, prior yeah. to uh, the summer when he was uh, ultimately going to end up here with the Spurs. But I've been, I'm kind of looking at this 70 to 75 game mark with the Spurs schedule. I think that at that point they may slow him down, kind of get him ready because he's also going to play in the Olympics too. Yeah. So we do know from the past experience with guys like Manu, Tony Parker, that those guys obviously put a lot into mm-hmm. the Olympics as well. That's going to be taking place this summer. So maybe they kind of get him a little bit of rest. But you were saying that you All think right, that see. they just need to – I'm, I'm going to I'm going to go the other way because I think he needs as much playing time on an NBA floor mm-hmm. as he can get. He needs to get that experience. I don't care if it's like three games left or one game left. He needs the NBA game time experience to take to France and then come back next summer and get ready for uh, for next season because yeah. I don't. That's invaluable. I yeah. mean, you can practice well, till you're blue in the face, and they need practice. But unless you're out there. Learning from a guy like like this guy that just yeah. took him for 45 yeah, he points. Did take he did. I he mean, did. you know, you can't you can't get that in practice because yeah. you don't have one of those players going up against Wimby. So you got to get that experience on the floor, and I think uh, I think that'll help him. Speaking of experience, David, all right, Spurs going to play at the Kings. Ooh. Another uh, very good big, big man there, Demonte Sabonis, yeah. uh, one of the best here in the Western Conference. So we'll see if Wimby plays. Uh, Do the math. 13 to 49. That. How many games I got left? Quick math. Anybody? Mm, 20. 20. Four and nine is yeah, what? 62, right? That's a 62, what? Justin. 
20 more games, that makes yeah. it 82? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? Wow. Okay, what's 13 and 49? Somebody add that up. Two. I was right. It's 20. Yes, you're right. Oh, man. So, all right, Steph. So we got 20 left. We got, we got two to go. We got 20 to get two. All right. Yes. 20 to get two. Go Spurs. Go. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we think. I don't know. Modern math is Sacramento. Math. I was going to say, uh, five news people walk into a room. <laughs> <laughs> How long does it take? Thank goodness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 942, 66 degrees. Well, as we head to break, let's look at the roads real quick. We told you about that fog, but uh, there you go on this shot there at I-10 and Martinez Creek. You can see it. Uh, we have a lot of fog there. Not too bad here. I-35 South at Loop 1604. We'll be right back. This morning, Connecticut is debating whether to shut down cell phones in every classroom across the state. But as ABC's Andrea Fuji tells us, they would use a method you'd only see at concerts and comedy shows. If you were to walk around the building, you would, you would not see a phone in this place. These middle schoolers in Connecticut are going cell phone free. Participating in a pilot program, the governor hopes will keep them from getting distracted in class. I'm showing my age, but I do find that social media is sometimes fundamentally antisocial. And I think too much smartphone makes you stupid. The kids have the option of leaving their phones at home or locking them in this pouch. Students get to hold on to the pouch, but can't access their phones until they're unlocked at the end of the day. So far, the program is getting mixed reviews. It's important to them to have a cell phone in case of emergency. I'm not a fan of cell phones in school. I didn't grow up with cell phones in school. We got them taken away. We had to keep them home. Actually, I didn't even have one until senior year, so... I would love for no cell phones. The governor is pushing state lawmakers to regulate cell phone use in schools. Florida was the first to take a stand on the issue last year, banning student phone use during class and blocking access to social media on school district Wi-Fi. Lawmakers in Oklahoma, Kansas and Vermont have also introduced proposals for phone free schools. And Congress is taking up the issue, looking into the mental health and academic issues. Some kids in Connecticut agree being phone free in school isn't so bad. Times and times we just take it out and use them out of nowhere and we get distracted very easily and I could 100% agree with that. Critics of the various government proposals say it should be up to schools to police phone use. One survey found nearly 80% of schools nationwide have already banned phones for non-academic use. Andrea Fuji, ABC News, New York. We are gearing up for the total solar eclipse in April. Parts of Texas are in the path of totality. We already have a lot of good eclipse information online, including the local times for the eclipse, details on some public viewing events, and information about how to protect your eyes during eclipse viewing. But what else do you want to know about the event? To, to let us know, let us know rather, on KSAT.com. And you can find that article and much more on KSET.com. You can get there by scanning this QR code on your screen right now. We're going to have full coverage of the event on GMSA that morning and online when the eclipse is actually happening. So keep it right here on air and make sure to download the KSET Weather Authority app, which comes in handy for all sorts of things. Also on KSET.com, Kirk County Judge Rob Kelly has issued a disaster declaration ahead of the total solar eclipse on April 8th in anticipation of impacted local resources and a huge surge in vis visitors to our region. The county is expects to double or triple it or more people than its population of over 53,000 on eclipse weekend and into Monday, April 8th. We're about to get a lot of company around here. Yes, so be aware of that as well. It's a big deal. It really is. And uh, just to, to let you know, behind the scenes, we're working a lot. We've got some stories. Uh, some of them have already been posted to KSN.com, but Mia and Sarah's, Sarah's been working on some great maps on the Eclipse Authority page if you want to check it out. Shows you exactly where your house is or where you need to go uh, to get into the path of totality. But we're going to have a lot of content for you coming up. And yes, it is a big deal. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people here, a lot of visitors from all over the world. Yeah. It's kind of cool, though. It really is. Uh, it's exciting. And so be prepared for traffic and all those sort of things. You want to start making plans now, as I said earlier. All right, let's talk about the fog that we've uh, got out there at the moment. It is uh, still thick in spots. But we're seeing some improvements. Stinson, most notably, since we last showed you this map here just about 10 or 15 minutes ago, 
Uh, you remember that was down to a quarter of a mile. Now it's up to a mile. So we're seeing some good improvement. Uh, New Braunfels, Randolph, Port SA. Now even at the airport, starting to see visibility come down a little bit. So that's that advancement off to the north and northwest that we were talking about. I want to show you some of the various transguide cameras. That'll give you a better perspective of where the, where the fog sits at the moment. Downtown 37 Houston, you can kind of see that there's still some fog there. 37 at Loop 410, uh, that has gotten much, much better compared to what it was looking like earlier. 35 at Southwest Military, still some low hanging clouds, but the fog's not so bad. 10 at the Y, looks fine there. So in general, I, I'm seeing visibility is getting better. Uh, even 10 at Martinez Creek, yes, there is fog there, but it, it looks better than what we saw just a few minutes ago. Uh, so here's the satellite picture. And that's kind of that wave of fog that we're seeing, this thin strip here. Uh, so that's uh, moving across San Antonio as we speak, and that's why the visibility is starting to drop off at the airport too. Uh, so you'll see visibility come down a little bit there. Uh, it's, it's right along I-35, kind of interesting how it's setting up this morning. Uh, and you can see the moisture advancing in that direction. We can see that with the dew points. So dew points have come up even more uh, since the top of the hour, now up to 61, and that moisture pushing Northwest is what's helping to create that fog this morning. Right now, 68 degrees at the airport. East southeast really winds at about 7. Uh, and here's the forecast for today. There could be some storms to our north across north central Texas, but nothing here. It's just going to be a partly to mostly cloudy day. As we get into tomorrow morning, I think there could be some fog, maybe some patchy mist or drizzle here around San Antonio, and even a few showers uh, during the day. But we don't expect much. It's actually going to be Thursday night where our better odds rain start to kick in. This is Friday 2 a.m. And I show you this because that's when we start to see some development. Now, this is not uh, a time of day where you would expect a lot of severe weather. Uh, but we could see a couple strong storms. And then as this advances east, this is 7 a.m. Friday morning. Uh, looks like we could see some showers and storms here. So we need to keep that in mind for the Friday morning commute as well. It could be a little bit wet. And then that front comes through. It's dry and warm on Friday afternoon. Then we get another front. This one brings in cool air Saturday morning and the weekend will be chilly. That risk of severe weather highest across the hill country on a scale of one to five, about a two up there. We're at a one. So again, not widespread severe weather, but there could be some strong storms mixed in here and we'll certainly be uh, monitoring that as these fronts come through. So 30% chance of rain Thursday morning. Thursday afternoon is a little lower. We bump it back up to 40% with some isolated severe Thursday night. And Friday morning, 30% chance, but the rest of Friday, we dry out. Uh, 76 Thursday, 81 Friday, that's that warmth I was talking about. But then we dip down into the 60s for highs Saturday and Sunday, lows in the 40s. It'll be chilly this weekend, uh, but we rebound nicely going into spring break. You guys know I'm always thinking ahead, and I know severe weather season is coming. I've got one of those uh, windshield shields, oh, windshield window shades yeah. for oh, cars. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. I've got an old one, and it's not the thin kind. It's got a little padding on it. Yeah. It's too big for my car, but what I do is I put it I put it under my windshield wipers on my windshield when I know hail's in the area. Oh, Very that's smart, smart too. Yep. That, yeah, that, smart. that'll save you some money down the line. Yeah, well. 952. Let's go ahead and look out there with Transguide real quick. Uh, looking over at I-10, things are moving so far this morning despite some of that fog. We'll be right back. Fog is lifting. We'll see temperatures up around 84 today and then look for a 40% chance of rain Thursday night into Friday morning. All right. Well, thank you, Justin. Yep. Thanks for joining us.